Um, our speaker tonight, Lisa, received her BA from Wellesley College and did graduate work at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University under the eminent art historian Kirk Varnado. Uh, she was a three-year layman fellow at the Me Metropolitan Museum of Art and then went on to be the New Hall Curatorial Fellow in the Department of Photography at MoMA in New York, a really very prestigious position. There, she organized the first exhibition in this country of the work of Bernard and Anna Bloom, uh, who were photographers and installation artists, and she also assisted on shows and publications on Nich Nicholas Nixon and other aspects of the history of photography. Her primary research interest is modern art and fine art photography, but she really specializes in German photography. During a nine-year stay in Europe, she worked in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum and for the government-sponsored Contemporary Arts Council. In Brussels, she was visual arts coordinator for the British Council, interviewing directors in the various contemporary arts centers uh, throughout the country. And she's a, she arrived here in Atlanta in the year 2000. And uh, the exhibitions she's organized in, between then and now, um, of which there are many, include the following. Uh, Under Different Circumstances, a show that uh, appeared in 2003 at, the, at Atlanta's Contemporary. Uh, German Cameraless Photography for the Marshallwood Gallery, which was in 2004. Claire Corey, Digital Paintings uh, for Solomon Projects, that was in 2005. And more recently, Forest Primeval, which was a group show um, organized for Mocha GA downtown, and that was in 2006. Lisa has served on the executive board of Atlanta Celebrates Photography, and she's currently preparing a site-specific public art project for them with the artists Bradley McCullum and Jacqueline Tarry, and that will be for ACP's 10th anniversary in October of this year. And those two artists presently have an exhibition at the Keon Gallery. In recent months, Lisa has reviewed exhibitions for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and she's also a regular contributor to Art Papers magazine. Uh, in addition to all of that, she's also a member of Art Table, a national professional organization for women in the arts. The title of Lisa's talk tonight is Through the Spyglass, Politics and Play in Street Photography, 1960 to the Present. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Kersner. Tonight I will speak to you about some aspects of American street photography using the work in Julian's wonderful exhibition drawn from the highest collection now on view. In a sense, this show is a prequel for the civil rights photography show and after 1968 opening later this spring. We will see how some of the same concerns and ideas running throughout all the work of this decade appear here. Here I show you one of Gary Winogrand's New York street scenes next to an image from Danny Lyon's photo essay, The Bike Riders, from 1966. <clears throat> this show reminds us of the extremely eclectic and tumultuous time of the 1960s, and the pictures seem to reflect so many aspects of its society. Both these images demonstrate, through form and content, <clears throat> how this aura was captured and manufactured by photography. Like an invisible street predator, Winogrand pursued his subjects up and down city streets, shooting with a rhythm that echoed the music and television reporting of his time. Lyon's bike rider, caught in the action on the road, suggests the speed, freedom, and itinerant behavior of much of the young population of America during the 1960s. Julian asked me to consider this work in the context of voyeurism tonight and how this idea in art and psychology, which is actually inherent in the photographic medium, has impacted the street work we're going to be looking at. And um, so that's the tack I'm going to take. Okay. On the left, I'm showing you uh, a picture by Paul Martin from 1911 in a street market in England. And on the right, I'm showing 
Oh, is this too high? Hey. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, and on the right, I'm showing you uh, Lactique's portrait of a woman in the Bois de Boulogne, 1911. The small camera was made for big cities. In fact, photography as a medium developed in the mid-19th century, just at the moment when the urban landscape was developing in Europe and the social classes after the re Revolution of 1848 began to unravel, creating at least the illusion of a more even social playing field. We can recall that the modern novel of that time, from Zola to Flaubert, and Baudelaire's sketch of the flaneur, the street strutter of Parisian boulevards, provided literary parallels to the activities of photographers in city streets. Shortly after the turn of the 20th century, Kodak was producing mass celluloid film, commercial printing papers were available, and the Granny and the Graflex cameras were priced within reach of ordinary citizens. Thus, the upper class and the scientific preciousness of photography eroded somewhat in favor of a more gleeful and populist aesthetic and subject matter in snapshots of anonymous activities photographed in the city landscape. Cameras went everywhere, to the beach with Paul Martin, this is not the beach, this is a market, but he did great pictures of the beach, and to the Longchamp races and to the Bois de Boulogne of Paris where the rich strolled with their dogs in Paris with Lartigue. Between 1911 and 1925, several versions of the 35 millimeter camera appeared, small hand handheld cameras that used motion picture film. The Leica appeared in 1911. Um, these last images are examples of curious amateurs bringing photography into their everyday lives. The camera wielded several roles in its development through the 20th century, both as a scalpel to dissect the comings and goings of the anonymous street culture of modern cities, as well as a more personal use. The modern camera with its smaller viewfinder and one-eyed peephole stance lends itself to characterizations as a voyeuristic tool. And here on the left, I'm showing you Paul Strand's uh, very famous image of the blind woman. <clears throat> and the right, from 1916, and the right is a portrait of um, a very well-known courtesan in Paris called the Contesse de Castiglione. And this is much, much earlier from an 1864 album by a photographer called Pearson. Um, she was the mistress for the Emperor Napoleon III and was um, uh, very interested in how she showed herself off to her, uh, her social public and hence she commissioned an album of uh, herself in fancy dress and other poses. Here we find the photographer and the subject acting from both sides of the lens. Strand shoots the blind woman on the city street unaware and makes of her an object, an uninflected billboard for highlighting social problems, while the countess, as subject, takes ownership of the photograph by directing the photographer and acting towards the lens. She might have even been the first proponent of the, proponent of the directorial mode, which we know from the 1970s. Um, other images in this album include body parts, um, close-ups of body parts, her feet, erotic images, uh, faceless images of herself. And so just one more historical picture before we get to the 1960s. This is a, a work by Eric Solomon, uh, a German photographer in the 1930s shooting inside a German courtroom. Um, not even in the right organization here. Hmm. Well, what I wanted to say about this picture is that Solomon was using the Erminox camera, which is a very small spy camera, sort of the, um, the forerunner to the Minox spy camera that you might know from James Bond movies. And it was, um, had a very, was a very fa fast camera, although it did use glass plates, which had to be changed. So he photographed for uh, picture press magazines in Germany in political debates and then also in, camera, in courtrooms where he was photographing without a flash. And you begin to see in pictures like this 
where the, um, the language of street photography that we know from the 1960s really starts to appear, where um, he's photographing one subject, but from a lower point of view, uh, someone caught off guard. He's, you know, looking, she's unaware of the picture. Uh, and, of course, you have all kinds of things in the foreground and on the side that don't seem to be a, of a very deliberate compositional structure, and these are uh, formal elements that we'll see in most of the photographers that we look at in Julian's show. Um, these next two pictures are by the uh, news photographer called Ouija, Arthur Fellig, and um, I'm very mixed up here. And he was working in New York, <clears throat> leaving, um, arriving at the scene of a crime with his large news camera and gigantic flash bulbs as soon as the police called in crimes in the 1930s. On the left, you see a snap he took of um, someone who had been murdered, and the shoe is underneath the, the tire of this car. And of course, and on the right, you see two suspects being um, taken away in a paddy wagon with their, with their heads covered. And Ouija's photographs, many of which were very, very gruesome and, and, um, and highly shocking because of the high contrast value, shows the disorganization of how we read documentary photography. So again, there seems to be no real centerpiece of the composition except for this lone shoe, which you might think uh, represents somebody who's, a, who's no longer on the scene, having been taken away to the morgue, and a hand coming out of the, the, the car up there. So it, it's a very unclear picture, but it looks very disturbing. And on the right, of course, these two masked figures um, uh, taken from this sort of scant, looks like he was photographing just on the street inside the back of the paddy wagon. And so again, he's, he's photographing below, sort of looking up and flashing so that you get that white, um, very flat look in the back of the, of the van. And um, his, his work was very, very influential for the whole idea of news photography in, uh, in New York and tabloid journalism throughout the 1930s and 40s. And he then published a book called Naked City uh, in the 1940s, which collected all of his, um, some of his more gruesome pictures. One cannot discuss voyeurism in street photography with Ad also taking a look at some, some of the things that were going on during the era of surrealism in Paris. On the left, I'm showing you a portrait of Versailles from the 1930s, a couple kissing in a cafe. And on the right, I'm showing you one of uh, the surrealist photographs of the German Hans Belmer, who constructed his own sculptures and then photographed them of, um, of dolls in his series called Les Poupées. And of course, part of voyeurism is erotic gratification, use of secret vantage points, sordid details, the, the idea of seeing without being detected. So there are two aspects we should consider, is both the photographer engaging as voyeur recording without being detected, which you get the idea of in, um, in the Brassai, and then also in in Belmer's picture of being very alone with erotic fantasies and basically constructing erotic fantasies in the lens. And of course, the surrealists were particularly enamored of the dreamscape, Freudian um, psychology, and the idea of realizing um, the, uh, uh, you know, of realizing sexuality and dream life in, in, in reality. And so much of their work was constructed dreams great reality for the camera and also in paintings as well. So again, we have private versus public, secrecy, furtiveness alluding to an action made in isolation. Um, something else we should think about is that the transportable size of the camera meant that this tool was also applicable to recording the modern city and social problems. And so the small camera was an opportunity for the private view to be taken into the public realm. And here I'm showing you on the left a Walker Evans portrait of the 30s 
made in the New York subways. And on the right, I'm showing you a picture by André Cartège made in Paris in the late 20s. Evans used a buttonhole camera to make these subway portraits um, primarily in 1938, in which the sitters were clearly unaware that they were being captured on film. Like stalking a prey, Evans said his subway pictures were his idea of what a portrait ought to be, anonymous, documentary, and a straightforward picture of, man of mankind. One thing that we really see here is that low light, um, differential focusing, people who are unaware that they've been caught on film, uh, a very deadpan, and of course, um, the light, the ambient light is really from the lights in the subway. And Cartege, using this uh, more Moholy Nage overhead bird's eye view of coming, taking this picture uh, on, um, over the uh, streets of Paris or the boulevards of Paris where the citizenry looked like little ants and the statue, in other words, that statue almost becomes Cartege's view onto a population who really can't see him. So again, the viewpoint, whether it's under or overhead, becomes um, a very active part of street photography and voyeurism. After World War II, the college-educated classes began to see photography as a tool for social change, much like Jacob Rees, Lewis Hine, and the documentarians of the FSA and the Depression did, including Walker Evans, Dorothy Lang, Ben Sean, and others. All of the photographers in the exhibition downstairs were college educated and interested in the sociology and anthropology of some sort. Gary Winogrand, who I'm showing you on the right, uh, was a student at Columbia University. Susan Macellis was at Sarah Lawrence. Danny Lyon at the University of Chicago. And Dennis Darling studied uh, right here in Atlanta with John McWilliams. Um, Though most sold pictures, most of the people who were taking pictures at this time were trying to sell to news agencies to make their living, but the goal was also to publish photographs with or without text in book format, and this became the major outlay for um, artists who were interested particularly in social problems and in combining um, text with images. Walker Evans's American Photographs this is actually what Robert Frank, was um, one of the first documents from the 1930s that was really the Bible for phot photographers interested in making a collective portrait of any particular aspect in America. And that was certainly something that Robert Frank was aware of when he did his travels across America in the 1950s. And the picture I'm showing you on the left is um, from the Americans. It's uh, the Hoboken Parade from 1955. And the picture on the right is <clears throat> Winogrand's hard hat rally from the mid-60s. Um, in 1959, Robert Frank published The Americans, which set a new standard for photography with a message. Frank broke all the rules of the fine print aesthetic set by Minor White and the Westons. Nominally, his topic was the state of post-war America as seen through the eyes of the European. But the images take on a very different tack from the usual current events fair of life and look magazines. Using first a roller flex and then the Leica, Frank moved through the American landscape and made pictures that cast a personal point of view on the social landscape. On his work, he said, most of the time I, I was absolutely silent, walking through the landscape, through the city, and photographing and turning away. This is my temperament, to be silent, just looking on. What I liked about photography was precisely this, that I could walk away and I could be silent, and it was done quickly, and there was no direct involvement. On the outside looking in, therefore a voyeur, an onlooker, not someone specifically involved with the political landscape. Um, I really show this to you to see what the standard was in this sort of 50s mode where Frank was trying, using very grainy film, his pictures were not focused as had been the case in magazine photographs, they were not evenly lighted, and the poetry of his 1950s pictures really shows someone who feels very isolated from what he's seeing in the American landscape. There is the poster of the American flag cutting off the protagonists, and there is a, a, a viewer up there watching the parade, but also not being seen by the photographer. 
and um, a very different view in the 1960s is of all the demonstrations that were taking place on the streets and cities and college campuses on Washington, in Washington, um, beginning with the civil rights era and then going through to um, anti-war protests in the late 60s and equal rights for women and so on. So obviously we're in a very, very different moment. Um, so how does all this feed into the work in the street photography show? We can see two ways to look at two decades. Further isolating, further isolating of the working class in the small towns of America versus the optimism of the carefree gesture of the city girl with ice cream cone. Hold on a minute. All right. Robert Frank on the left from the Americans, and then the cover of Gary Winogrand's Women Are Beautiful book, which was published in 1975. Um, we can see two ways to look at two decades here. Furtive isolating of the working class in the small towns of America versus the optimism of the carefree gesture of the city girl with the ice cream cone. Winogrand's affluence, women are dominating the suit figure behind her versus the Santa Claus who's spreading traditional Christmas cheer that's somewhat stale in the diner above the very passive uh, waitress. The field for Winogrand's magpie strategy of standing on street corners and following his nose for pictures was wide open. City dwellers were still not fearful of the photographer on the street. As Joel Myrins recently told me, today it's so much harder to be a street photographer as the use and abuse of images is so much more frequent than it was in the 1960s. The ability to be a Fifth Avenue spy in the street was much more possible at that time. Two, these are two more pictures of Winogrands. On the left is a demonstration at Kent State, 1970, and the right is a picture from his um, Los Angeles work, 1969. Uh, Gary Winogrand had his first solo, ex solo exhibition at MoMA in 1963, in which he showed street work. Um, and then 1964, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship to travel to the Southwest and then out to California. Um, some of his most other famous work were in, in 1966, he was part of the uh, influential Towards a Social Landscape exhibition that Nathan Lyons organized with Lee Friedlander, Dwayne Michaels, Bruce Davidson, and Danny Lyon. In uh, 1969, he published The Animals, 1975, Women Are Beautiful, and in 1977, Public Relations. In 67, Winogrand was included in MoMA's new documents show in which John Sarkowski tried to redefine news and contemporary issues work that seemed no longer tethered to a news magazine storyline program, certainly by the late 60s with Winogrand, Lee Friedland, and Diane, uh, Diane Arbus, whose documents were much more personal takes. In Winogrand's case, we see the formal language of his picture composition in both his more newsworthy and his street corner pictures with his signature wide angle lens splay in the foreground, dominating shadows and off-center framing. From the way his, sh from the way his, sh he, his shooting is described by other photographers, he shot constantly pulling his Leica across a, a scene while snapping away. And this scattered technique improved for him over the years and really gave him, he had a, an absolutely intuitive sense for what was going to be in the far reaches of his, uh, of his pictures. For example, there's the fellow in the suit with the gas mask on the right, you know, just going out to the frame and on, on the right of this picture. And then, of course, you get this sort of blurred woman falling out of the frame, really uh, translating the idea of anxiety. And then, of course, the splayed foreground with these shadows coming out looks like everyone is really falling out of the picture. And that all of these, what were then no-nos for straight composition, you know, straight classic photography became the hallmarks of Winogrand's style and really translated the emotional fervor of the time in his still photography. And again, um, uh, this picture is so wonderful in the, the Vs of the shadows, sort of echoing the Vs uh, of those girls' legs and the formation that looked like little, you know, sort of, uh, flying formation coming down the street, and um, very ebullient. 
Now, this is a, not a picture by anyone we know. <laughs> we know. This, this picture came from a show of photographs taken by triggered automatic cameras during bank robberies in 1966. The show was entitled One-Eyed Dicks, and it was an exhibition of photographs at the Museum of Modern Art taken from um, automatic surveillance cameras. And again, when we're talking about voyeurism and modernism with Andy Warhol making screen prints and making eight hour long films of people sleeping, uh, this was a very radical idea to take a look at how anonymous photography could influence what people were trying to do in translating contemporary culture. The show was organized by a curatorial intern called Bill Burback, who then went on to uh, the Albright Knox Museum. And um, his idea was to show photographs free of aesthetic judgment, free from selection, everyday life without inflection, without ch making any obvious choices. Um, the cameras, once activated, uh, snapped at a rate of two, per, two, two uh, shots per second on 35 millimeter film. And then I have another picture of um, a couple of frames that were shown in the museum. So there are the people getting under the desk in one frame to the next frame and everyone just sort of standing around looking very scattered. And in a certain sense, I thought this was interesting because when people saw Winogrand's work, some of them thought, well, you know, this is, doesn't seem like planned photography. But then this show came along and uh, really upset a few, a few um, uh, art goers, museum goers at, in New York. And I wanted to read you uh, a, a passage from a letter uh, that was written to John Sarkowski, then the head of the department about this show, and he says, how do you know whose work deserves to be hung in the museum? My confusion was at seeing the work of Mr. Bruce Davidson almost concurrently with color slides taken by an auto-mechanical device in a bank. I flatter myself to believe that I do understand the most extremely disciplined, beautifully organized, reverent work of Mr. Davidson's East 100th Street exhibition, but what does his work have that is even remotely related to the robot camera and Sarkowski replied very eloquently in this letter, it seems to me that there is a quality in the bank robbery sequences that is extremely photographic and subtly unfamiliar, the relationships of the figure to the frame, the lack of explicitness, the mystery in the storytelling, the unpredictable change in design from frame to frame. All of these are familiar aspects of the photographer's problem, visible in all the robbery pictures in an oddly heightened way. Even the strange banality of the robberies and cells is interesting to me, probably because it is unexpected. I would have supposed the bank robberies were much more dramatic and coherent in action. And I just think this is such an interesting idea uh, as we're talking about these kinds of compositions in the 1960s, this frenetic time period where um, art was becoming anonymous, where crowds were big, where television was how we were getting all of our news and where things from, you know, the SLA to the Vietnam War seemed to be falling apart in this country. So looking at the four photographers in our group, we might say that two of them, Danny Lyon and Susan Micellis, work more closely in the photojournalistic vein, while Dennis Darling and Gary Winogrand operate more loosely without specific affiliations. Uh, Lyon and Micellus were very drawn to photography partially because of its power to affect social change, its power to bear witness, and to make visible some slice of society not normally in our purview. And Lyon, born in 1942, was a self-taught photographer and filmmaker. He studied, as I said, at the University of Chicago um, and then began to work for the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. For the, Southern, for the Southern Civil Rights Movement um, right after graduating. And he will certainly be a part of the exhibition that Julian's going to be mounting uh, next door in a few, in a few weeks. Um, so these are two images from his series on Chicago bike riders, which he actually did in the 19, early 1960s, where he went and lived with riders. He rode himself in college. 
he met someone who was riding around, and he followed them, lived with them, took uh, tape-recorded interviews, and made notes. And so the publication, The Bike Riders, really is an anthropological document as well as a photo book, and I think is in style a real hallmark of, of, the, of the age. He said, when activist photography first appeared on the scene in the early 60s, we assumed that a revolution was at hand. Here was a medium that was realistic, easily artistic, and democratically available to anyone that could, could afford the $1 cost of bulk-loaded tri -X. So again, you have um, the guy in the diner taken from behind. It's a portrait, but again, it's an anonymous portrait. It's, 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 um, it's, it's almost like in Frank's mode of what is going on in America, in the heartland. And I think the anthropological idea of this project and also of my cellists was, as I said, to find, to make visible something that was really not visible. And in that sense, it is also a voyeuristic enterprise. It's almost a, a, a case study that each artist got very involved with and got close enough to people who were sort of below the radar uh, by becoming part of the group and then using photo documentation, if you will, to record it. Um, and this is one of Dennis Darling's pictures of probably taken almost 10 years later. He was also involved with the Chicago bikers, but this was not until uh, the 19... 1970s, and his pro project was also his thesis for uh, for his um, artwork at uh, graduate thesis at the Art Institute of Chicago, where he did his graduate work, and again um, went down and hung out with bikers in a much less involved way than um, than Lyon did. In fact, when I spoke to uh, Dennis Starling over the phone, uh, he said that the work that he did at this time. Is, was almost done by a different photographer than he is today, and he, he feels very removed from it, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, he said he's shooting two and a quarter now, and he's doing magazine shoots and photo essays out in the country and not really getting as close to people as he did before. And the last person who's in the show is Susan Micellis, and this is the uh, front picture, uh, the frontispiece picture for her book on carnival strippers that came out in 1976. Um, again, it was started as a photojournalistic essay where uh, Micellis, who studied at Sarah Lawrence College and then visual anthropology at Harvard, took her camera through the uh, carnivals in New England in the early 1970s and spent three consecutive summers with the young girls who were basically uh, advertising themselves outside of carnivals and then doing strip shows uh, inside the tents for guys who would uh, pay before they were obviously let in. And I heard her lecture about this project in Atlanta a few years ago, and she said it was, it, it was very, it took her a very long time to get into the work because, in fact, women were not allowed in the audience inside. And when you think about uh, being a, a gra an educated woman with a camera at that time of the women's liberation movement, I was sort of struck at how, what an odd topic this was for her at the time. But when you look at the book, it really is about the fierce independence of the women and, uh, and how they, you know, some of them are, of course, preyed upon, but also how they try and find some sort of life away from a life for themselves. Okay. So those are the four people in the show. And here I'm showing you two, I'm going to show you several pictures from each of the bodies of work. Here are two of Denny Lyon's um, early pictures from SNCC. Uh, this is a high school student in Atlanta from the early 1960s, probably the first summer that he went down there. And on the right is an organized sit-in at a lunch counter with uh, the SNCC movement. And Lyon, um, as Julian will tell us, was a bona fide member of the appointed photographer for the movement. His photographs were, were published 
in their literature, in their books, uh, was really, his pictures were used as political tools. And it's, in that sense, I think you can really even bring them back to the photographs of, uh, you know, John Hartfield in Berlin in the 1930s, really protest photographs and uh, sort of coming to this, you know, breaking out of the lens, the immediacy, right underneath it, there, you know, there's no differential focus and all he wants to do is get that sort of animalistic chokehold on camera and then show the rest of the world what was going on. On the right, you can see it's a much more organized picture and uh, again, I think he's focusing on all these faces very, very calmly, the idea of keeping everything calm, nonviolent, and again, this was used for, uh, you know, for advertising and propaganda for the movement. But of course, he became very involved with this work, and it's extremely, extremely heartfelt as well. Now, on the left, I'm showing you, a, this is a picture from the Carnival Strippers book, and on the right is one of Gary Winogrand's um, park crowd scenes. Now, these are, I guess, both more pleasurable experiences than the crowd, than the, um, the Danny Lyon picture, but again, you see that, uh, that all these photographers are really putting everything in the foreground of their pictures. They are, they are quite close, although um, some of them use wide-angle lenses. But again, Mycellus often shoots from behind the stage, so you get an idea of where you are. She's behind the woman, and she's watching the woman being watched by these other people. And so Carnival Strippers really is, in a certain sense, a whole it's a whole game of voyeurism, the whole book is, because, of course, we're fascinated by all these different faces. The fact that there's a child in, in this audience is sort of horrifying, but the face looks so angelic, and then you think about what they're looking at, and it you know, provokes some pretty mixed feelings. <laughs> and um, again, on the right, Winogrand's picture is often, you know, the, the expressive way he uses um, sunlight, you see light bleaching out things, you see shadows overtaking uh, pictures, uh, sh subjects in the pictures, and, um, and everything is usually off center. There's always, there's a good arm there, there's some half faces there. So it's almost like taking William Klein's, you know, New York book and just scrambling it a little bit more. But again, you can see, how these um, sort of city street pictures really do have elements in voyeurism in the way they often have someone in the foreground that is almost standing in for the photographer. There's two different pictures. On the left is one of Winogrand's pictures from Boston from the early 70s, girls sitting in the window of this restaurant and on the right, another Mycellus picture. This time, she is standing in the crowd of men behind the, behind the men watching the stage. So again, there, you can't see the stage, you only see this uh, vision of the girl on the stage who almost looks like a poster. And of course, these shadows are uh, you know, hulking in the foreground and giving you an idea of secrecy that the viewer is sort of hulked low behind and really almost participating, although the girl looks very far away because of how the lighting is. And in Winogrand's work, again, never lines anything straight up at the camera, so everything's always angled, giving the scene a much more frenetic look. And you know, to me, this seems like a takeoff on, on um, you know, girls in the um, sort of Antwerp red light district where people are sitting in the windows, but of course he's taking great pleasure in the sort of play of freeze of legs here and the fact that she's looking at him, but no one seems quite bothered by it. And again, really gives you an idea of what the, um, the era was like with much more permissive uh, and frank behavior. Michelle, this is a, another picture from Isolis' work, and to me, it's a, it's a very powerful and a very sad picture and really um, com calls to mind some work that we'll see in the 1980s from people like Nan Golden. And um, again, she's getting away from telling a whole story within a big composition, 
you know, th this, um, this figure almost looks like a, a, a sad person who's almost not even related to those two girls on the side of him, and it's, it's a very mysterious picture. Uh, here she's got two girls. This is Marcellus with the girl resting in the back. And here is one of Gary Winogrand's well-known pictures of the girl in the phone booth. And uh, again, two different views of voyeurism, but here, you know, Mycellus is really <clears throat> letting the viewer see the sort of, with these angles, the, the chaotic lives that these girls are leading and how exhausted she is, but, you know, still in a very graceful pose, extremely um, unaware or unbothered by the fact that she's photographing her which I imagine in 1976 was, was very, um, you know, was a very bold kind of picture to take. And Winogrand, of course, being on the street of this, uh, watching the girl from across the street, lifting up her leg in, in a mini dress, is the absolute classic Gary Voyeurism picture. And uh, again, with the crazy angles and the men walking by. A happier view. Uh, again, these kinds of angles that you see in all the pictures here used by Mycellus again, and here something very similar in Gary Winogrand's um, picture of a, of a beggar. But here, of course, Winogrand really uses this, this crazy angle to focus on the, the exchange, willing or unwilling, between the white hand and the, and the black hand here. These are um, a couple of portraits. Susan Marcellus did these uh, portraits of each of her girls at the end of the book. And this is a young girl, Lena, who she became very good friends with. And she's using a you know, medium format camera here. And it's not all you know, grim and horrible. These girls really try to find some self-respect in what they were doing. It's the same way that Danny Lyon, oh, um, in the picture on the right, is um, is really very admiring of these gangs, and these were his friends, and, and uh, very adulatory portrait. Here's one of Lyon's pictures uh, out of a bedroom window in Louisville, which is actually in the show. And again, he's you know, got the curtain in the foreground and sort of sneaking a view down to the guys picking up their bikes. And of course, uh, Marcellus returning to this same strategy in yet another one of the um, carnival stripper books. So the effect of looking at the carnival stripper book really is the idea of peeking into something over and over and over again. Um, and again, this is one of the pictures on the left of Mycellus watching these guys, watching the girl, and in a very blatant picture. And in the right, she re Susan Mycellus, who's one of the uh, Photographers with Magnum, who agencies photographed all over the world, done work in Nicaragua, San Salvador. She did uh, a, another sex project, really, in a S&M club in the 90s called Pandora's Box, here shooting in color. But to me, these look uh, really much more staged and almost look like Hollywood sets compared to her work in Carnival Strippers. And I just want to show you a couple of the um, a couple of the people who certainly were influenced by this idea of voyeurism and liberation of the body. Here is a picture by uh, oh, uh, Lorca de Corsia of a, a pole dancer in 2004 really like a sculptural body floating in the middle of, uh, you know, floating in midair. And really, it's very much, it's, it's, a, it's voyeuristic, as he's done other portraits of people in the streets using a long camera and taking them without being aware. But here, I think they, this is a very um, sad and beautiful picture and is a very far cry from the Mycellus work. And on the right, I'm showing you Nan Golden's <clears throat> Ballad of Sexual Dependency from the mid-'80s when she was photographing herself in the picture with, um, in the midst of the Lower East Side drug culture, which she was very much a part of. And Nan's work is often about voyeurism, but she puts herself in the picture 
in a very more conscious way, I think, than the voyeurism of the 60s was. Uh, another artist working today, Sophie Call, who is a conceptual artist, I would say, who's used photography. This is a picture called Sweet Venetienne on the left. Sorry, I keep losing these pointers. Where um, she's basically followed a man from Paris to Venice and photographed him along the way. So she often makes black and white photographs of her prey as she's working on them and following people sometimes for years and then making a fictitious, a blend of fiction and nonfiction um, story. And on the right is, this is a piece from her latest work that was shown at the Venice Biennale last summer about women who were giving suggestions to a lovelorn artist and it's sort of the ultimate voyeurism because she doesn't want to be seen and Sophie's trying to see what she's up to. And just to close, I wanted to give you a couple of shots of Winogrand who in the sense is, I guess, the happiest of the street voyeurs here and the one who I think really uses the structure of his cam picture making to ally with his form and subject matter interest. For example, this picture, which I'd never seen before, is actually the bath, the girl, the ladies' bathrooms in Central Park, which I think is really hysterical. So he was positioning himself right outside the bathrooms watching girls come out. Um, this is one of his, you know, most glamorous portraits uh, from the 60s of the woman uh, on the street using his abrupt angle being watched by the two men and again, making this triangle between the photographer, the subject, and the subject being watched. And then this sort of classic frieze of girls uh, along a, a bench in Central Park, completely unaware that the photographer is, um, is watching them as well. And um, I open the floor to questions. If there are things I misstated or missed, I'd love to hear about them and answer any questions you have. Uh, what was the artist's name that did the picture of the stripper? The artist's name who did the picture of the stripper? Yeah. Susan Mycellus. That was Susan Mycellus? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I actually have her book with me if anybody wants to look at it. Any more questions? Well, I, thank you so much for joining us then. And thank you, Lisa. It was a wonderful lecture.